Can't wait for the RPM 2023 awards. Who's looking forward to the RPM Awards 2023? I knew this Praying was for an RPM Awards I, I, I 2023. I knew this was going to happen. Waiting for the RPM 2023 Awards still. I'm curious, will we get the 2023 RPM Awards? Can you do another award show PLS? Where's the 2023 award show made? RPM 2023 Awards? When is the award show? RPM Awards 2023 or you like men? That's Great ridiculous. cover. But where is the 2023 ridiculous. RPM Awards Adolf? Fine! I will do the award show! Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the RPM 2023 end of season. Yes, I know it's now February 2024 and pre-season testing for this year was last week and we are now days, if not hours away from the Bahrain Grand Prix and I should have done this months ago, but I didn't and I wasn't going to, but then you dickheads wouldn't stop commenting about it. So we're going to do it right now, prize giving ceremony. And once again, I have my certificates. And to be honest, even though I spent a lot of time doing these, I mean, they look like they've been drawn by a fucking spastic. Breakfast. Doesn't matter. The first category is Disgusting Meme Intensifies of the Year. This is an award for the most Disgusting Moments of the Year. In third place, the Jackie Stewart incident at the Miami Grand Prix. Martin Brundle was wrapping up his grid walk when he spotted Roger Federer, but wasn't able to get to him because of the security barriers. But then! A wild Jackie Stewart appears. He sees Martin struggling to get Roger's attention, says, I'll go and get him for you, slips under the barriers, charges towards Roger before being apprehended by security personnel. How dare they? This man is a legend of the sport. How dare they obstruct him? How dare you? And look at him. Oh, he looks like a dementia patient trying to break into a petrol station at three o'clock in the morning. But despite being thwarted by the security personnel, he managed to grab Roger by the arm and drag him over to Martin Brundle for the interview. Absolute gangster. Unfortunately, we only saw about 10 seconds of that interview because the F1 TV director immediately cut away from it to show us this monstrosity. Because it was Miami, of course they had a big, over-the-top, cringy parade where all the drivers walked out to a fake orchestra conducted by Barack Obama. So obviously, we were watching that instead of the interview with Roger Federer that Jackie Stewart risked his life for. Obstructing the legend of the sport? How dare you? Forcing us to watch Barack Obama conduct a fake orchestra instead? Disgusting. Disgusting! In second place, Lance Stroll. The inbred has now been in Formula 1 for seven years. That's two more years' experience than Lando Norris, Osama Bin Russell, and Alex Albon. It's only two years' less experience than Max Verstappen. But while every other driver gets better the more experienced they become, somehow the inbred gets even worse. Let's take a look at some of the highlights of his 2023 season. At the Singapore Grand Prix, he fucked into the barriers in qualifying on Saturday, causing $1.3 million of damage and then had to sit out the race on Sunday because he had a broken twat. He crashed into the back of Fernando Alonso at the first race of the season, almost costing him a podium. At the Qatar Grand Prix, he gets knocked out of Q1 for the fourth race in a row, gets back to the garage, throws the steering wheel out of the car, and physically assaults his personal trainer. And some of his smooth brain fans tried to defend him. It wasn't assault, the PT was in his personal space. Shut up! At the Monaco Grand Prix, he qualified 14th on the grid while his teammate was fighting Max Verstappen for pole position. He crashed into multiple drivers during the race, was running down in 16th, and then on lap 55, shags it down the escape road at Mirabeau. Which isn't a terrible mistake. Carlos Sainz did exactly the same thing. Osama Bin Russell did exactly the same thing. The difference is, when Nobed reverses out of the escape road, he made it about 10 more seconds before he fucked it into the barriers at the hairpin. And then he made it about 7 more seconds before he fucked it into the barriers again. But it wasn't just the big moments that highlighted the dangers of inbreeding. At the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, Fat Boy had Pyrrhus Hamilton right up his arse. Now, at this part of the season, the Aston Martin was a vastly superior car 
car than the Mercedes, as proven by Fernando Sigmalonso multiple times. But despite having a superior car and Fernando Alonso scoring five podiums in the first six races of the season, Aston Martin was barely able to stay ahead of Mercedes in the World Championship because Fatboy wasn't pulling his weight. At the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, he had Puris Hamilton right up his arse, but then on lap 16, he clips the wall on the outside of turn five. Very lucky he didn't break the suspension and retire, but that was irrelevant because 30 seconds later, he slides out of the final corner and hands the position to Puris Hamilton. And this was at the same race where on lap six, when he was behind Fernando Alonso, he came on the radio and said, I will not attack. Here's Lance Stroll, gained a couple of places. Fernando, I will not attack. We are both playing the same game. Copy that. Fernando, I will not attack. We are both playing the same game. F first of all, as if you could attack Fernando Alonso. I will not attack. I don't think you have the facilities for that, big man. Secondly, you are not playing the same game as Fernando. Fernando is playing chess and you are shoving pieces of Lego up your arse. And this is my point. My point is, when the Stroll bandwagon defends him by saying things like, well, he's better than Nick DeFries or Logan Sargent or Guan Yu Zhou, he's not a rookie. Does any of this look like a Formula One driver with seven years of experience? No! Having the nerve to think he could attack Fernando Alonso, disgusting. Disgusting! Smashing the car to pieces every other race, crashing into the other drivers, and crippling Aston Martin in the World Championship, disgusting. Disgusting! Behaving in a way that would get any other driver fired immediately, but instead of getting fired, the team principal, Mike Arsecrack, defended him because he bought and owned by his daddy. Disgusting! Disgusting! I'm kind of retarded. Causing me to have an actual aneurysm and break my table so I had to buy another one from B&Q for 30 quid. Disgusting! 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 And the winner of- I just blacked out for a second there. And the winner of Disgusting Meme Intensifies of the Year is the Las Vegas Grand Prix pile of shit. Now, to understand why Las Vegas was such a shit show, I have to give you a small history lesson, a short view back to the past. Gentlemen, a short view back to the past. This is Roman Grosjean getting yeeted into the barriers in practice for the Malaysian Grand Prix. What happened? If we look at the slow motion replay, as he approaches the apex of the corner, you can see something sticking up at a 45 degree angle. And when he runs over it, the rear tyre explodes, pitches the car into a spin, and sends Roman into the fourth dimension. A few moments later, the camera cuts to a marshal carrying a drain cover. This is Rubens Barrichello getting yeeted into the barriers at the 2010 Monaco Grand Prix. What happened? Well, if we look at the onboard footage from Antonio Liuzzi's car, he's got Barrichello just ahead of him as they climb up the hill, and if we pause the footage right here, you can see something is protruding. That is a real word. Protruding. It was a loose drain cover that Barrichello had just ran over, destroying the rear suspension and sending him into the fourth dimension. This is Osama bin Russell four years ago in Azerbaijan. As he heads down the straight towards turn three, it looks like the car shat itself all over the track before completely switching off and grinding to a halt. A few moments later, the camera cuts to a marshal carrying, you guessed it, a drain cover. It was dislodged by Charles Leclerc's Ferrari a few laps before, and then Osama Bin Latte Boy ran straight over the top of it, ripping the arse of his car to pieces. The damage was so bad, Williams had to replace the entire chassis, and it also didn't help that the recovery truck that was carrying Russell's car crashed into a bridge, twatted the crane arm, which then started leaking hydraulic fluid all over the Williams. The car was making its way back to the pit lane, but you can see it's on a low loader. Yeah, you can see you can see the uh, the crane that has winched it on there. That's hit the underside of a bridge, and now the oil from the crane is leaking onto the car. This session is not going to be restarted. 
Formula One is the pinnacle of motorsport. And there's more! At the 2016 Monaco Grand Prix, an inspection hatch cover bounced up onto the track before Jensen Button ran into it, destroying the front of his car. At the 2005 Chinese Grand Prix, one Pablo Montoya ran over a drain cover, damaging the front right tyre and sending him into the pit lane for repairs. And there have been multiple occasions where a car has damaged a drain cover, causing a session to be red flagged. So by this point... It is well established that drain covers are little bastards. Fucking little bastards! And they can do enormous amounts of damage if a car runs into them. So, hypothetically, if Formula One went to a brand new track that had never been tested before, on a street circuit with hundreds of drain covers, knowing that Formula One cars can suck them out of the ground and send them into the fourth dimension, surely they would do something to make sure that definitely would not happen. Because, like I said, Formula One is the pinnacle of mo- Breaking news. Fox 5 News starts now. The first free practice of the Las Vegas Grand Prix comes to a screeching halt in the strip tonight. Formula One officials confirm within the last hour the cause is this right here. It's a loose drain cover. Fucking dirty little He's, yeah, he's done it again. You he's done it again. That is a fact. You fucking little bastard. So after all the hype, after all of the memes about the Gorlock Dome, the $12,000 ticket prices, and listen, I know I made an entire video slagging off the Las Vegas Grand Prix before the weekend even started, which some people criticised me for. They said, why don't you just give it a chance? Why don't you at least give it 10 minutes? Okay, all right, 10 minutes. Seven minutes and 25 seconds into FP1, everything goes arse over twat. Because not only did that drain cover cause over a million dollars worth of damage to Carlos Sainz's Ferrari, but then over the next several hours, one of the biggest shitstorms of the entire season unfolded. That is one big pile of shit. So let's go through this chronologically. Carlos Sainz gets twatted by a drain cover, causing over a million dollars worth of damage. Now, because we're in a cost cap era of Formula One, and spending an extra fat mill on damage that wasn't your fault would put you at an unfair disadvantage, there was a suggestion that the FIA would give Ferrari something called dispensation. That is a real word. <laughs> Basically, they would be allowed to repair the car without having to dip into the cost cap budget. When Roman Grosjean got twatted by a drain cover in Malaysia, causing $750,000 worth of damage, Haas was later compensated by the circuit. So when the exact same thing happened in Las Vegas, was Ferrari dispensated? No! According to the FIA themselves, the stewards note that if they had the authority to grant a derogation, what the fuck is a derogation? Is this another word I'm going to have to look up? An exemption from or relaxation of a rule or law. Learn to pronounce. Yes, please. Click... Here we go. Dare, raw, gay. Ha! Gay! The stewards note that if they had the authority to grant a derogation in what they consider in this case to be mitigating, unusual, or unfortunate circumstances, they would have done so. However, the regulations do not allow such action. So even if the FIA wanted to give Ferrari the dispensation derogation, they couldn't because it's not possible. But that's simply not possible. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? And then it got even worse! Because not only did the drain cover do over a million dollars worth of damage, but because Ferrari had to change so many parts on the car, including the engine, the survival cell, and the battery, the FIA gave them a 10-place grid penalty. <laughs> But it wasn't just Ferrari that got screwed by the drain cover. FP1 was cancelled and FP2 was pushed into the next day at 2 o'clock in the morning so that the FIA had time to have a nervous breakdown trying to fix all of the drain covers. So for the people who bought Thursday practice tickets only, they got 7 minutes of FP1 and then had to wait around until 2 o'clock in the morning for FP2. That kind of sucks, but at least they are going to get to see cars on the track in FP2. 
right. Wrong! Formula One announced that they will be closing all of the fan areas before the start of FP2. But because Formula One's communication department is run by an actual monkey, nobody had any idea. So people did wait around until two o'clock in the morning. And when FP2 did start, they were thrown out by the police. There were even videos on social media of people on the outside of the track watching the cars through a reflection of a nearby window. And remember, the average ticket price for the Las Vegas Grand Prix was $57 million. So obviously, people were furious. And the next day, we got a very carefully worded statement, none of which of the words were sorry or refund. But don't worry, because all of the people who did have to remortgage their houses to buy the Thursday practice only tickets received a $200 voucher that could only be redeemed in the official F1 store. $200 in the official F1 store. Oh, God! So you can put a 5% deposit down on an official Ferrari cap. As you can imagine, people didn't take that too well. Outraged fans demanded their money back, but F1 offered only $200 merchandise vouchers to those who had purchased a single day ticket to the practice sessions. Dissatisfied with that offer, a group of fans filed a class action lawsuit in a Nevada court. That does seem pretty serious, but according to the pumpernickel smuggler, it was no big deal. We are Thursday night. We have a free practice session one that we're not doing. They're going to seal the brain drain covers and nobody's going to talk about that tomorrow morning anymore. How can you even dare trying to uh, talk bad about an event that sets the new standards, new standards to everything? And then you're, then you're speaking about a drain cover that's been undone, that has happened before, that's nothing. It's FP1. Liberty has done an awesome job. And just because in FP1 a drain cover has become undone, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be moaning. Talking here about the black eye for the sport on a Thursday evening, nobody watches that in European time anyway. Come on. Why would he so passionately defend Formula One when they've done something obviously disgraceful. Maybe it's because he has a 33% stake in Mercedes, which is currently worth $1.2 billion. And a lot of that value is heavily correlated to the stock price of Formula One. Giving Ferrari a 10 place penalty after doing a million dollars worth of damage because you didn't check the track was fit for purpose. Disgusting. Disgusting! Having the fans wait around until two o'clock in the morning only to kick them out as soon as the session started. Disgusting. Disgusting! Refusing to give them a refund and instead giving them a $200 voucher that they have to spend on Formula One merch so all they can do is put a 5% deposit down on an official Ferrari cap. Disgusting! <laughs> Certain people trying to brush it under the rug because it might affect their own personal interests. Disgusting! <laughs> so well done, Formula One, on winning disgusting meme intensifies of the year. Well done! And the next category is... Latte Drinking Femboy of the Year. In third place, Osama Bin Russell, for the time he posted a sponsored Tommy Hilfiger advert on Christmas morning. Oh, he's such a good boy for the brand, isn't he? Christmas is supposed to be about Jesus Christ and getting molested by a family member, not corporate sponsorships. And who wears a turtleneck? Ted Bundy used to wear turtlenecks, and I'd still rather spend Christmas morning with him than this latte-drinking corporate shill. Righty. In second place, Osama Bin Russell for a different corporate advert he did where he pretended to work on a computer and eat some breakfast. <laughs> I'll see you there. Who the fuck? <laughs> Who the fuck eats toast directly out of the toaster with fuck all on it? What sort of psychopath? That might be the most scandalous thing he's done so far. So add that to the list of things, along with ordering a nice latte with any milk is fine, wearing ankle socks, blowing up the World Trade Center, and now we know he eats toast like a psychopath. And a nice latte for me. And the winner of Latte Drinking Femboy of the Year is... 
Osama bin Russell for his campaign of terrorism across the 2023 season. At the Spanish Grand Prix, he tried to kill Pierce Hamilton by forcing him off the track in qualifying. He blew himself up at the Australian Grand Prix. He shagged into the barriers at the Canadian Grand Prix while he was running in fourth with no pressure from behind. At the Monaco Grand Prix, just like the window licker, he shagged it down the escape road at Mirabeau and then rejoined the track in a dangerous manner, causing a crash with Sergio Perez. At the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, he blew a hole in the side of Max Verstappen's car. At the Dutch Grand Prix, he was holding up Puis Pamelton and then almost dropped it at turn seven. Old hot tires! Oh, he oh. put a wheel on the grass. And we all took a step back in the commentary box and I can't believe that George Russell's still in the Dutch Grand Prix. At the Qatar Grand Prix, he rammed Puis Pamelton off the track and I know Puis accepted 100% of the responsibility, but he only did that because of systemic racism. Hashtag Team LH, hashtag VoidLap58, hashtag never forget. And then we all know what happened at the Singapore Grand Prix. Mercedes pulled a big dick move with the strategy. Is it a big dick move? Because their strategist is a woman. It was a fat clam move. They pulled a double stack under the virtual safety car, came out of the pits, stormed up to the back of Lando Norris and Carlos Sainz, and should have been able to breeze past them with a huge tyre advantage and plenty of laps to go. Latte Boy had a vague sniff on lap 59, but wasn't able to get past. He's got Puis Hamilton right up his arse, who is now complaining on the radio that Latte Boy is holding him up. And as the laps count down and time starts to run out, Latte Boy cracks under pressure, clips the wall on the outside, outside of turn 10 and fucks it directly into the barriers. So congratulations, Osama, for all of your fantastic achievements over the 2023 season. Well done. Right, I'm going to have to start rapid firing some of these, otherwise we're going to be here all day. Throw him in jail of the year goes to Fernando Alonso for murdering the lizard at the Singapore Grand Prix. R.I.P. Lizard. I've ripped my cock off of the year goes to Fernando Alonso for his final lap overtake at the Brazilian Grand Prix and then a photo finish across the line. I did rip my cock off. I, I call my cock Little Rocket. I shouldn't have said that. Pavarotti would be spinning in his grave of the year goes to Ferrari. Breaking down at the first race of the season in Bahrain and then having a 10-place grid penalty for the second race of the season. Charles Latifi fucking into the barriers multiple times. The nervous breakdowns in the pit stops. The civil war they had at their home race in Monza where they were getting within millimetres of each other, side by side, locking up, driving each other off the track. And then Ferrari came on the radio and said, OK, you can still fight, but no risk. And no risk, no risk, race until the end, no risk. <laughs> Contradiction in terms. <laughs> so obviously, 20 seconds later, Charles Leclerc has a 200 mile per hour lockup and almost takes both of them out of the race. Fun! And the final category is... Now that's a lot of damage of the year. Now that's a lot of damage! So when I was conducting my investigative journalism for this category, I found a spreadsheet on Reddit. Because somebody who clearly has more time than sense has been keeping track of every single crash of the season and how much it cost. This is actual investigative journalism on Reddit, which is supposed to be a platform for memes and trans domestic terrorists. So all of these numbers are based on estimated cost, plus the official documents you can find on the FIA website. In third place, Sergio Perez. His most expensive crash of the season was in qualifying at the Monaco Grand Prix. This is the official FIA technical delegates official report official, and look at the list of things they had to replace on Sergio's car. All of this added up to over a fat mill in a single crash. At the Hungarian Grand Prix, he did half a fat mill by fucking it into the barriers. He got sideswiped by Puis Hamilton at the Belgian Grand Prix, causing $320,000 of damage. He did $350,000 at the Japanese Grand Prix, $320,000 at the Qatar Grand Prix, 200 grand at the Italian Grand Prix and 320,000 at the Mexican Grand Prix, bringing the grand total for the entire season to 3.2 million dollars. No, that's a lot of In second place, Carlos Sainz. Now, to be fair to Carlos, 
before the two final races of the season, he was actually about 10th on the list with $1.5 million. But then the drain cover in Las Vegas, and even though that wasn't his fault, it did $1.2 million worth of damage. And then at the final race in Abu Dhabi, he drops it at turn three, slides into the barriers, and causes a fat 850 Gs in a single crash, bringing the grand total for the entire season to 3.6 million dollars. No, that's a lot of damage. And the winner of now that's a lot of damage of the year is Logan Sargent. His biggest oopsies of the season includes the Japanese Grand Prix, where he got a snap of oversteer coming out of the final corner, which twatted him directly into the barriers. $1.1 million. And look at the face of his mechanics. This is what an abusive relationship looks like. At the Dutch Grand Prix, he had two massive crashes. One in qualifying and then another one in the race. Consistency. Plus a few other excursions across the entire season, bringing the grand total to... 4.3 million dollars. No, that's a lot of jelly beans up my ass. Oh, but we're only just getting started. Because now, I would like to drag you all down my rabbit hole. Are you ready for the rabbit hole? <sighs> control myself right now. This is Daniel Sargent, Logan Sargent's daddy. He owns a transportation company called Sargent Marine Incorporation. And according to an official press release by the Department of Justice, Sargent Marine Incorporation pleads guilty and agrees to pay $16.6 .6 million to resolve charges related to foreign bribery. Fun! According to its admissions, between 2010 and 2018, the company paid paid millions of dollars in bribes to foreign officials in Brazil, Venezuela, and Ecuador to obtain contracts to purchase or sell asphalt to the country's state-owned and state-controlled oil companies. International bribery. Nothing serious. And there's more! Because it's not just Logan Sargent's daddy, who is a slippery little bastard who likes to do international bribery. This is Harry Sargent III, Logan Sargent's uncle, so his dad's brother. Harry Sargent III is a billionaire who owns a company called Global Oil Management Group. And let me explain how he made most of his money. On September 11th, 2001, Osama bin Russell blew up the World Trade Center. That triggered a surge of troops into the Middle East. And just as the Iraq war started, Harry Sargent III bribed the Jordanian government to give him exclusive access to the fuel lines through the Middle East. A few months ago, Sargent was accused by Mohammed Al Saleh of wiring $9 million to the Jordanian government. The point of that wire transfer, Al Saleh's lawyers allege, was as a bribe to Jordan's intelligence agency to allow Sargent to use Jordanian thoroughfares to get fuel to US soldiers in Iraq. Nothing serious! And there's more! Because then Harry Sargent III got sued, lost, and was ordered to pay 20 $28.8 million to a member of the Jordanian royal family. But that was the least of his concerns, because when he refused to pay the $28.8 million, a London-based debt collection firm by the name of Burford Capital tried to recover that money by extorting him with a sex tape. Of course he had a sex tape! According to the Financial Times, so I had to pay for this fucking article, by the way, the files on the hard drive handed to Mr. Hall, who works for the debt collection firm, at a restaurant in South Beach included sex sexually explicit material featuring oil billionaire Harry Sargent III and a successful businesswoman in a heavily regulated industry that is reputation sensitive. I am so hard right now. Everybody take a deep breath. So he bribed the Jordanian government after 9-11 to get exclusive access to the fuel lines across the Middle East, and then he was extorted by a London-based debt collection firm with a sex tape. And there's more! How is there more? I cannot believe there is more! Because Harry Sargent III was using his exclusive access to the fuel lines across the Middle East to rip off the Pentagon. According to Harry Sargent's Wikipedia page, a Pentagon audit has found that the federal government overpaid Harry Sargent III by as much as $204 million on several military contracts worth nearly $2.7 billion. No, that's a lot of Trillion, three hundred million, billion dollars. The study also reported that the three contracts were awarded under conditions that effectively eliminated the other bidders. Sargent had won three jet fuel contracts despite despite having amongst the highest bids because he had an effective monopoly over the routes. Accusing Sargent and his company of price gouging and engaging in the worst form of war profiteering. 
So to be clear, to be clear, and I, I know we are now deep in the rabbit hole and I am about to pass out. Harry Sargent III, who is Logan Sargent's actual uncle, straight after 9-11, bribed the Jordanian government to give him exclusive access to the fuel lines across the Middle East. Then he was extorted by a debt collection firm in London with a sex tape, and then he was using his exclusive access to the fuel lines to rip off the Pentagon for $200 million! <laughs> so, the Bahrain Grand Prix is this weekend, is this weekend, is this weekend, weekend, this week. Bahrain Grand Prix. This transmission has been intercepted. Intercepted. Intercepted.